before I do that, if you have the extra credit, if you did the extra credit, go ahead and give that to me. Uh, the stuff about the play. So Old English G and C don't have necessarily their modern English um, pronunciations. It all depends upon where it occurs within a word. Okay? So if G comes before or after an A, a O, a U, or an ash, then it's given the hard G sound as in get or gate. Okay? Um, let's see if I can just find one real quickly. Well, Old English. Um, God for good, God for God. Okay. If it comes before or after an I, an E, or a Y, um, then it's pronounced Y, as in year. Okay. Or yet. And what I've given these are slashes. That's the phonetic um, transliteration for the sound. Okay. The C can be either a K sound or a ch sound. If it's before, after, a, o, u, or ash, then it's the hard k as in king or kin. So like Old English kinin or Old English kin, right? Um, that's not a good one to use because that's more like this. There, yeah, don't use that one. There's a reason for that. But we don't have time to go into it. Take my history of the English language course in the spring, and I'll go into that. Um, it's got the ch sound as in church or chat when it comes before or after an I or E or a Y. Okay? Um, so if you have the extra credit, hands up. If you don't, let's get started. La, yeah. Quick question. Um, which one of uh, all of our siblings starts the feud with the one that burned down the jar the first time. There is no burning down of her up the first time. No? You mean the in-law? Yeah, the in-law that... Uh, Ingild, Ingild, son of Frode, is the one who is referred to in footnote 4 on page 86. Which we might get up to where that's related again today, but I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, line 455 is where we are picking up. We just left off with... Beowulf saying, uh, I'm going to fight Grindel. God will determine the winner. If I lose, send whatever is left of me. This will not show up on an exam or anything like that, so don't worry about it. Um, just in case you're curious. If anything shows, if anything of me is left, send it back to Hela. So then Hrothgar began, fit seven, saying, for past favors, and we talked about that. Okay, For past favors, you have come, meaning you owe me. I saved your father's behind, probably when Hrothgar knew Beowulf as a boy. Okay. Um, I paid the feud off for him, and that's why you're here. Okay. You're repaying a debt. So, he goes on and says, picking up about, I don't know, 476 or so. My hall troop, my warriors are decimated. We are to swept them away into Grindel's terror. God might easily put an end to the deeds of this mad enemy. Now think about that. God could easily put an end to the deeds of Grindel. Okay, if we accept that on literal face value, and we know that God hasn't, right, because it's been happening for 12 years, then what should one assume? Is it that God's indifferent? God doesn't care? Or is it that, okay, so if God can do this, but he doesn't do this, doesn't that immediately beg the question, why? Okay. So, often men have boasted, drunk with beer. Officers over their cups of ale that they would abide in the beer hall. Grendel's attack. So notice, it's after they're plastered. That they said, oh, fire Grendel, and they end up washing them out in the morning. 
Then in the morning, this meat all lordly dwelling was drenched with blood, daylight gleamed, the bitches gory, hall spattered and befouled. I had fewer dear warriors when death took them away. Sit down, Beowulf. Have a seat and do what? Drink. This has got to be humor, I think. This has just got to be humor on the part of the poet. They get three sheets to the wind, and they say we're going to kill Grindel, and Hrothgar is saying, sit down and have a beer, Beowulf. <laughs> Drink meat in my hall, the reward of victory, as your mood urges. So they clear a space for him in the hall, for the men of the gates all together. They went and sit down, proud in their strength. The thane did his service, bore the bright ale cup, etc. The shope sang brightly. Bear in mind, it's the shope singing brightly that angers the misbegotten man out in the woods. And then Unferth comes in. And Unferth has a specific role, right? And that role is to challenge Beowulf. But the manuscript, your gloss tells you, the manuscript, every time Unferth's name shows up, it's spelled like this, Unferth. And every, almost, almost, like 99% of them, modern editors change the name to this for the simple reason that in every instance where Unferth's name shows up, the alliteration needs to be on that vowel or a vowel, okay? And so all these modern editors think, well, the scribes of the manuscript were idiots. They didn't know what they were doing. Seems kind of hard for me for a modern editor who's a thousand years removed to the language from the language to think they know more about the language than a native speaker of the language would. Okay? A lot of language is age of silence. Bingo. Bingo. In a lot of languages, and we have instances in Old English where the H is silent. French, it's definitely silent. There are no initial <laughs> sounds in French, okay? So, Unfer speaks, and you've got a gloss there saying the name may be significant, meaning unpeace or unreason, okay? So Unfer stands up. He's the son of Edgelof, Beowulf, son of Edgethaal, servant of the sword, Unfer, son of the edge, means sword, Lof, leavings, what's left behind of the sword. Well, that doesn't mean, you know, decapitated bodies and all this kind of stuff. It means what's left behind in the making of a sword, like iron filings. Son of iron filings. Not very threatening. Son of servant of the sword, however. That's a pretty cool name if you're a warrior, okay? So Unferth comes up and he unbinds his battle runes. Got a gloss down there. Or unleashed his hostile secret thoughts. Rune simply means secret. I know your gloss says often, but usually it's more simply. Okay? Why does he uh, unleash his battle runes? What does the poet Tell us. He insults Beowulf. No, before that. The brave seafarer sorely vexed him. For he did not wish that any other man on this middle earth should care for glory under the heavens more than he himself. He's angry that somebody else has more glory than he himself. Well, guess what? Beowulf's not the only one. So does Hrothgar. Okay? Now, this is where it gets important. You've got the hall. So here's the interior of the hall. Here's the hearth. The hearth is a sunken pit in the middle of the hall. Okay. Have a fire. Smoke rises. If you were looking at the hall from, you know, the top view, it would be kind of like this. This is the ridge of the ceiling. And right here, or the roof, there would just be a hole in the roof. And the smoke would rise from the fire. 
if you're looking from down the roof on the inside like this, there would be smoke hovering. And it would slowly make its way out through that roof, okay? So, here's the fire. A bench is brought here. Beowulf's going to be sitting here. There is a seat here with a big bench in front of it. This is Hrothgar's, right? And probably after the feast, they clear the benches away. So Hrothgar sits here, Beowulf sits here, they talk across the fire. And then at Hrothgar's feet sits Unferth. And his wife's flitting around, and on either side of Hrothgar are his two, uh, take that back. They're not, they're going to be over here. Hrethric and Hrothmund are going to be sitting by Beowulf. Okay? So, he comes up and he goes, are you that Beowulf who strove with Brecca in a swimming contest on the open sea? Blah, 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 blah. And what's the point of his whole little speech here? Brecca won. You guys, because you were spurred on by egos, challenged each other to a swimming contest. And Brecca won. And you really think you're going to beat Grindel? Come on, you can't even outswim him. So, they toiled in the water for seven nights. The swells bore him to the heather ram shore, etc., etc. So I expect, line 525, a worse outcome from you. And Beowulf replies, now, you invite a guest into your hall, and the guy sitting at your feet utters this kind of challenge. What's he, he said, put it in modern terms. Not too modern, don't go too street colloquial on me. Keep it clean. What does he just call Beowulf? You're a wimp. You can't do this. Beowulf. This might be an example of what's called flitting, or a flitting episode. It comes from Old Norse and Old Norse sagas. A guest arrives, a guest is there to do something. Somebody stands up and challenges that guest. And the whole purpose of the challenge is one thing. Prove it. Show your credentials. That's like saying, show me your ID. Okay. So in a traditional flipping episode, the person then replies and gives his reasons, his evidence, let's say. Beowulf kind of takes the flirting episode, and to some of us at least, Anglo-Saxon scholars, he takes it and he ramps it up. He, he jacks it up on steroids a bit. He goes maybe just a little bit too far. So, what a great deal, Unferth, my friend, drunk with beer. You have said about Brecca. Drunk with beer. You wouldn't what? You wouldn't be saying this if you were sober. Right? Because Beer wonderfully has the ability to do what? You Loose the tongue. Okay. Told his adventures. And then Beowulf kind of cues the Paul Harvey voice, if you're familiar with Paul, Paul Harvey, and it says, and now for the rest of the story. In other words, you've heard part of the story of my swimming contest with Brecca. Here's the whole story. We were just boys. <laughs> when we two agreed and boasted, we were both still in our youth that out on the great ocean we would risk our lives. And we did. And so what's the first part of Beowulf's speech? We were children. Which means? Times have changed. OK, what else? We were young and stupid. We were young and stupid. I mean. It's kind of the proverbial, boys will be boys. Boys will be stupid boys. We were stupid boys. And we did it, actually. Okay? So we had bare swords. We swam in the sea. Hard in our hands. Thought to protect ourselves from whales. That's what the swords were for. He couldn't get away from me on the sea waves. Nor would I go from him. That is, nor could I get away from him. That we, were, we were even, neck and neck. We were on the sea. It wasn't seven nights. It was five nights. Okay, so it's 
one little detail of your story that's wrong. What else? Until the flood, the sea, drove us apart. Surging waves, coldest of weathers, darkening night, and northern wind. Okay, now let's pause for a moment. Where are they? In the middle of the ocean. Which ocean? The this is ocean. not the Mediterranean and it's not the Gulf. The Atlantic Ocean. Sea. It's the Baltic Sea. Oh. Because where is the land of the Geats? Southern tip of Sweden. I remember reading about this once. I can't remember where. I think the, the pretty much average temperature of the water there, off the coast of Copenhagen, let's say, Denmark, it's like 46 degrees. Okay. Santa Cruz, area I'm from, average temperature is like 52. 46, even though it's only 6 degrees, makes a huge difference. Every year when I open my pool, we got an above ground pool. Every year when I open my pool, Way too early. It gets later every year because I get older every year. You know, sometimes I'll open it when it's about 65. That's pretty cold. If I were to open it when it were six degrees cooler than that at 59, I'd freeze fairly fat. Not literally, but my body temperature would drop so quickly I could suffer hypothermia. It's in the Baltic Ocean. Five days. No wetsuit. Armor. Just makes it even colder, right? Well, it doesn't make it colder, but he's heavier. It's like okay. 50 degrees or 50 minutes a year. Yeah, yes. yeah. So they're there for five, five days. <laughs> there he says, my coat of armor, it did offer help. Not because he had, he had you know, warmers in it. It offered him help, what? Against those hostile ones. Down to the ocean floor, a grizzly foe dragged me. Now is, just, is this just sheer hyperbole? Or does Beowulf literally mean down to the ocean floor? Are we talking it's shallow, 100 feet? Are we talking 50 feet? Is he, you know, has, have they waded into the water and they're kind of dog paddling in six, no, he's, they're way out in the middle of the ocean. We're talking probably several hundred feet. And the monster drags him down to the bottom. You or I, what would happen at 50, 60, 70 feet? Ear uh, eardrums would burst. And the farther down, we get down 100, 150 feet. What's happening? Your lungs. <laughs> First of all, you can't breathe. Well, you can't breathe anyways because you're underwater. But if you've been holding your breath, it's gone. He keeps going down. Okay? And he says... But it was given to me that to stab that monster with the point of my sword, the war blade, the storm of battle took away that. I killed it. Time and again, those terrible enemies sorely threatened me. I served them well with my dear sword as they deserved. Served them well is a pun. Because Beowulf's talking about chopping them to bits and pieces. They wanted to serve him as a meal for each other at the bottom of the ocean. Instead, he sliced and diced. So... They got no joy from their gluttony, those wicked man-eaters, when they tasted me, sat down to their feast on the ocean floor. How long was he down there? Hey, How long can he hold his breath? Well, but in the morning, wounded by my blade, they were washed ashore by the ocean waves. And he says, light shone from the east. Why? Because that's where the sun comes up. God's bright beacon, the waves grew calm. He could see sea cliffs. Nomad Passage. Weird often spares an undoomed man. Well, yeah, if you are undoomed, that means fate isn't against you. When his courage endures. So, he said, I killed nine sea monsters. I haven't heard anything about that like, about, like that about any other man under heaven. And then the sea washed me up. The currents of the flood... In the land of the Finns. Okay, so let me pause for just a moment because I don't think I've put up that map for you yet. But I'm pretty sure there's a map somewhere in the back of here. If I can find it. Yeah, there's one. Let's see. England, England, Ireland, and 
etc. Yeah, this will work. If you have your book on page 1784, you got a map of the world. Okay? So, in this map of the world, here's Denmark. Little thing sticking up off the northern coast of England, uh, uh, Europe. Here's England and Ireland way over here. Turn one more page here. Okay. So here's Denmark. Norway kind of sticks off to the side, off to the right side of Denmark. Sweden is the thing sticking down to the left of Denmark. And you got to go up, way up here, to get to the land of the Finns. So when Beowulf and Breca did their swimming contest, they jumped from the southern tip of Sweden into the ocean. They swam in the Baltic. Beowulf was caught by the waves, currents, and he gets deposited while still in the water on the shore of the fence. It's like 500 miles away. Okay. So, what should we assume about Beowulf at this point? As a boy. He's a superhuman? Bingo. Beowulf is not like us. In other words, Samuel Taylor Coleridge said, that you have to have the willing suspension of disbelief in order for literature to work. Because if you don't, and you read something like Frankenstein by Barry Shelley, friend of his, what must you immediately do when Frankenstein creates the creature? Well, that can't really happen. Well, it's stupid. People can't take body parts, sew them all together, and go, live. <laughs> and they suddenly... It's unrealistic. That's why you have to willingly suspend that disbelief. So what's the disbelief you have to suspend here? Well, let's go back kind of a lot earlier. That somebody could be dragged down to the bottom of the ocean and still live. <laughs> and fight nine sea monsters and stay in the Baltic Sea for five days. Plus whatever amount of time it took him to get from there, because that's when he was with Breca, to the land of the fans, all in the ocean. All right? So is it simply that, or is the poet introducing us to a different kind of tale? In what kinds of tales can things like this happen? Today we would say fantasy. What do fantasy, where do fantasy tales kind of derive from? Myths? What else? What's between myth and this kind of story? Folklore. Keep going. Starts with that same letter. Fairy tales. Fairy stories. You have the quintessential fairy tale kind of element here. In fact, we saw it with the opening of the play, uh, opening of the poem. In Yar the Goom, in days of yore. That means what? Once upon a time. Once upon a time, when there were great mighty kings who performed valorous deeds, we heard of their glory. Well, this is once upon a time land. And yet, some scholars try to take what's called the marvelous aspect of the He didn't really swim in the ocean for five days. I mean, that's, that's, that's exaggeration. Why? Because that's just silly. Kind of like Thomas Jefferson with the New Testament. Jesus didn't really raise people from the dead because we all know you, you can't do that. So what did he do? He went ahead and cut out all the parts of all the miracles. And so you took the New Testament, which was already a fairly slim book, and made it a whole lot slimmer. Why? Because the quote-unquote miracles didn't fit Jefferson's worldview. Well, similarly, some scholars view Beowulf in such a way that some of the actions within the poem 
don't fit their world view of how the poem should work. Okay? So they try to make Beowulf into somebody like an everyday, ordinary human, but who is bigger and stronger than most. We're going to see another example of this later. So he says, I landed up with the fins, ended up with the fins. Never heard of any such contest concerning you, Unferth. Come on. What great deeds have you done? Um, in the play of Battle Brecca, this is 584. Brecca has never, nor you either, done a deed so bold and daring with his decorated blade. I would never boast of it. Though you became your brother's killer, your next of kin. He was a, in Germanic fashion, or terminology, a kinslayer. Absolute worst thing you could do. Remember the fourfold Germanic epic? Duty to lord, duty to kin, duty to avenge your lord or kin, trust in weird. How do you avenge your kin if you kill him? Suicide? Nope. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. Okay. He's just called Unferd, a kinslayer. Where have we had a kinslayer referred to already within the poem? Cain and Abel. Where is Unferd sitting? At the feet of Hrothgar. Metaphorically, this is what? Okay, this is the hall, right? What is the hall for Germanic society? It's everything. <laughs> It is, it's, it's the basis of your identity. You know, when we were talking about the wanderer and seafarer seafare in exile, without the hall, you have no identity. The hall is where the king to, or lord distributes. Justice distributes. Treasure pays, you know, things and such. It's where there's revelry, where there's song. It's protection. It's civilization. Everything outside the hall, all bets are off. I mean, it's where Grindel lives, okay? So, if the hall represents that, where are they sitting? Smack dab in the center of the hall. And what, apparently, is at the very center of Hrothgar's hall? Kinslayer. A kinslayer. Is it any accident that right after the ribbon cutting, what do we get a reference to? Grindel. Well, even before that, before the reference to Grindel, what's the reference to? This whole mighty edifice will what burn to the ground. Why? Because of inter-family war. Civil war. Civil war always involves what? Kinslaying. If it's civil, that means intra-family. Okay? So, I don't think the poet... You know, just riding on along and says, oh, gee, I ought to have uh, uh, Unferth be a kinslayer. No. That's there from the outset. It's almost like Unferth is a magnet. Drawing. Hello, all you kinslayers out there, you monsters, you know, attracting it. Not literally, obviously. So, I would never boast of it that you became your brother's killer, you next of kin. For that, you needs must suffer punishment in hell, no matter how clever you are. And you've got a lengthy footnote. Unferth's fratricide brings the general theme of kin slain, represented by Grendel's descent from Cain, inside Hrothgar's hall. Because Grindel so far, I mean, other than coming to the hall and killing people every night for 12 years, Grindel comes from where? He comes from outside the hall. Okay. Poet seems to be suggesting what possibly about human society? Maybe we bring our own destruction from within. Maybe the problem of Grindel is really what? 
yourselves. Maybe the monster isn't really just the thing that's outside. Maybe there's that monstrous in each of us, which if one takes Judeo-Christian theology seriously, one would have to say, yep, that's it. Okay. So, notice, by the way, Beowulf said, you will suffer punishment in hell. Even though Beowulf's not a Christian, he's not Jewish, he shouldn't have any knowledge of the quote-unquote Judeo-Christian idea of hell. Okay, But the poet puts those words in his mouth. So he goes on. I will say it truly, son of Edgelaf, never would Grendel have worked such terror that gruesome beast against your lord or shames and error if your courage and spirit were as fierce as you fancy they are. If you were half the man you say you are, Grindel would never be able to come do this. Now that's a pretty good response. He might have gone a little bit overboard by saying he's a kinslayer. Okay? Because you would think that once he says that, Hrothgar's other soldiers would whip out their swords going, hey, you don't say that about our... But nobody does. In fact, Hrothgar laughs at the end. But he doesn't stop there. He just kind of takes it another, oh, I don't know, four miles, not another step. He has found, he, Grindel, has found that he need fear no feud, no storm of swords from the victory shieldings. Now, I read this as irony. It's, it's sarcasm. He calls them the victory shieldings and yet says, Grindel has nothing to fear from you. So how is he using victory shieldings? Like they're losers? Yeah. Ooh, how victorious you been the last 12 years, guys? No resistance at all. And now he kind of makes it clear. From your nation. Well, some guys have. Some guys take the challenge. Apparently every night they get drunk and they're going, oh, fire Grendel. And then they're... But he doesn't stop there. He takes his toll, spares no one in the Danish nation, but indulges himself, hacks and butchers, and expects no battle from the spear Danes, because their spears are like five-week-old um, stalks of celery. <laughs> They're useless, Beowulf is suggesting. Again, I think this is more sarcasm. You guys don't know how to wield a spear. But, but what? Grendel doesn't have to fear the victory shieldings, the spear danes, your whole nation. But I, I, one man, I will show him soon enough the strength and courage of the geats in war. Afterwards, let him who will go bravely to me. When I'm done with Grendel, let whoever wants to go drink as much meat as they want at night. In other words, get yourselves drunk as skunks. Why? You won't have to worry about Grendel anymore. So what has Beowulf just said about himself in comparison to the Danes? That he's a real man and that there is a bunch of rims. Exactly. We're going to see... Is this, this, yeah, it is this class. We're going to see in Sir Gallon of the Green Knight, whenever we get to it, not too long, a couple weeks, the Green Knight, who's huge, is going to come into Sir, uh, King Arthur's Hall. And he's going to challenge them. Let's do this little game. I'll let one of you take a whack at me, and then I'm going to take a whack at you. And they all sit there, and they go, come on, I thought you guys were men, I thought you were warriors. And then Arthur gets a little pissed off. And he says, all right, we'll fight you. He goes, no, I don't want to fight you. Because none of you here can fight me. You're my beardless children. No, he's saying that to King Arthur, Sir Gallon, Lancelot. I mean, studs. And saying, you're a bunch of eight-year-olds compared to me. That's kind of what Beowulf has just said. I'm kind of surprised he wasn't thrown out of a hole. Who's going to throw him out? 
<laughs> I mean, what did he say? I killed nine sea monsters, I slew a tribe of giants, oh, and I captured five. It's like, I've got them as pets at home. Here, let me show you my pictures, you know. <laughs> then the treasure of Giver was greatly pleased, gray-haired, and battleable. That is, Hrothgar. He's like, ready to go, bro. Here, I'm going to put my teeth back there. Ready to go. And what do they do? There's laughter of warriors. Seemingly, they all take this as part of this thing. In other words, he didn't mean any of that stuff that he he didn't really mean any of that stuff that he said about us, you know, being a bunch of wimps, okay? So, well, Thael comes in. Look at her name. We've already seen the Thael part, right? Where? Beowulf's father's name, Edge Thael, servant of the sword. This is servant or slave. So now we have, well, Thael. What in the world does well mean? We have this word today. It's just not spelled this way. And we throw a consonant at the end. Wales. As in the country, not the out in the ocean. Okay. And the Welsh. Is this, does this mean then that she is a servant or slave of the Welsh? No. It means she is from Wales. It means she is one of these people. Okay. But what does the word mean? Here's the kicker. The well means exile, foreign, which is why the Welsh do not refer to themselves as the Welsh. I don't want to be called an exile in my own land. No, they are the Kimri, and they live in Kimru, Gaelic, or Celtic, actually. So she comes in and she does what? She's mindful of custom. She's adorned with gold. She greets the men in the hall. She goes about to young and old, gives them a portion of a drink from a cup until she gets to Beowulf. Line 625. She greets Beowulf. She thanks God with wise words that her wish had come to pass. What was her wish? That she could rely on any girl for relief from those crimes. She's kind of like, oh, thank God. A real man. These guys are all, I don't know, think of your puny, tiny, wimpy actor, you know, character actor who plays that kind of part. And, oh, it's Chris Hemsworth. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> That's the difference, okay? 6448, kind of a, you know. He takes the cup, and what does he do? I resolved when I set out over the wave, sat down in my ship with my troop of sailors, that I would entirely fulfill the wishes of your people, or I would fall slain. I will perform this deed. And she goes and she sits, sits down beside her husband. Then there's more words spoken. The people are happy. And Hrothgar takes note of the track of the sun. Starting to get dark. Well, what happens when it starts to get dark? Grendel comes. Hrothgar's like, time to check out. <laughs> and so he tells Beowulf, line 655 and following, I've never given this hall to any man. That is, his thanes have stayed in the hall overnight, but he's giving Beowulf control over it. Now, I'm not sure that this is what it means, but I think this is what it means. Beowulf the yif stool, you know, I pulled up the seat the other day, set it here. The yif stool, the throne. Let's <laughs> see how it feels. His other men, nope, they couldn't do that. Okay? So he says, have it, hold it, protect this best of houses. Mindful of glory. And if you do, oh, you'll have treasure beyond your wildest imagination. So... Rothgar and his troop of earls, the protector of the shieldings, departed the hall. The war chief wished to seek wealth, Eyal, line 665, his queen's bedchamber. That is not what it says. The old English says. He wealth, Eyal, sekan, quen to yobedon. 
He wanted to bed his queen. Beowulf? No, Hrothgar. Oh. <laughs> and you would think that would really get Hrothgar. <laughs> Hrothgar leaves the hall to do what? To go have sex with his wife. While Beowulf's going to kill Grendel. That sounds like a plan. Not, not quite the same things going on, right? It's not even Elliot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good commander in chief, you know. <laughs> the glorious king had said against Grendel, Hall Guardian has been its head, blah, blah, blah. So, they're all gone. Here's the door into the hall. Beowulf and his men lie down. Now it's Beowulf, one of 15. Beowulf and 14 others. Right? So how do they lay down? Let's say you're not Beowulf. You're the least of the 14 others. Well, if you're a coward like I am, you sleep back here in the corner. <laughs> that is, you sleep as far away from the door as possible. But apparently they do something like this. So, they lie down, push the benches back, have their swords right here, so all they have to do is reach, and that sword's right at their hands. And Beowulf says 677. Now, if you've seen any of the Beowulf films that are available, one, I'm sorry, two, I forgive you, three, wipe that nonsense out from your mind. Be like Hamlet when the ghost tells him, Kill Claudius. I will wipe all fond saws and memories of previous Beowulf things from my memory because they're all horrible. Okay. If you saw the latest one with the um, Angelina Jolie with the tail, Beowulf doesn't fight naked. He's he is still clothed. I know bothers a lot of you. I consider myself no poor in strength and battle deeds and Grindel, but what does he say? I'm not going to use a sword. I'm going to fight a mono a draco. No, not draco, that's dragon. Mono a monstro, you know, man against monster. Okay? He says, let God decide. Let the wise Lord, the holy God, grant the judgment of glory to whichever battle hand seems proper to him. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of thinking maybe Beowulf's men are going, Beowulf? No. Use a sword. And a mace and a club, and if you got it, an Uzi and a Kalashnikov. <laughs> so he lay down, and around him many a bold seafarer sank to his hall rest. And then the narrator takes us inside the minds of Beowulf's men. None of them thought that he should thence ever again seek his own dear homeland. They're going to sleep thinking, We're dead men. His tribe or the town in which he was raised, for they had heard it said that savage death had swept away. Okay? But the Lord gave a web of victory to the people of the waiters, that is, Beowulf and his men, comfort and support. There's that Frovra again, the consolation theme, so that they completely overcame their enemy. How? Through one man's craft. So they collectively overcame their enemy through one man. Now, if you know your Bible well, and being English majors, if you don't, you should. I'll, let me just throw that out there. Why? Because English literature up to the 20th century, so much of it takes images, ideas, stories okay, from the Bible, Old and New Testaments, that you can't really understand it unless you do know it. St. Paul says, I can't remember which book in the New Testament, that through one man sin entered, Adam, so through one man sin was overcome, Christ. As through one woman evil entered, Eve, Mary is a medieval idea. Okay? So, through one man's craft, their enemy was overthrown by his own might. It is a well-known truth that mighty God has ruled mankind. There's a gnomic passage. Always and forever. Okay? 
It is a well-known truth. That is, it is axiomatic. What? What's the rest of that little passage mean? God is in control. That's it. Okay? In the dark night he came, creeping the shadow goer. The bowman slept to the hole of that horned hall. Hrothgar's men are asleep. All but, uh, excuse me, Beowulf's men. All but one. So Beowulf's like this. Just kind of looking all around. And we get three times. Language that's kind of like, in the dark he came, in the dark he crept. He slithered among the moors. Why? Because the, to the poet is trying to build up that suspense. He's trying to amp up that terror. So Grendel comes. And what does he do? He simply touches the door and they burst open. It's not like they can figure out how this lock works. He simply touched it. And we get a description. Seven. Uh, let me back up just a second. Let me back up to 7-Eleven before he comes. Then from the moor in a blanket of mist, Grindel came stalking. Are we really only at 17? He bore God's anger. The Old English. Godus era bear. Godus God's era ire bear. Bore. Now how can you bear something? Because you can bear it in multiple ways. You can carry it on your back. You can carry it in your arms like a child. You can what else? You can have it like this. You can grin and bear it. How else can you bear something? Like a weapon. Okay, like a weapon. You can bear something like it's not you're actively physically carrying it. Because a weapon, something on your, all those things you're doing. But it says he bore God's anger. You can, as Hamlet says, bear the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Well, what's he mean by that? The problems of your day. We all have to grin and bear that, right? We can't, you know, just wake up every morning and go, I'm free of all my problems. And then they pile on you again every day. So, he bore God's anger. That verb bore can have two meanings. He has it <coughs> on him against his will as what? Why would he have this? Descendant of Cain, right? Part of the feud. How else can he bear God's anger? Like this. He can come carrying. It's another word for bear. Bringing God's anger. And that makes Grendel then into what? He becomes an agent of God. Go back to the Old Testament <coughs> story, dealing, long story, dealing with Moses and Pharaoh. What does God repeatedly do to Pharaoh? All plagues of Israel? No, no, he, hardens hardens his heart. Heart. he hardens his heart. For what purpose? So that Pharaoh will keep saying, no, 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 no. Moses keeps doing miracle, 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 miracle. For what purpose? To finally allow God to send whom? Who gets the angel of death? Gets sent to Pharaoh. Notice, death is what? An agent of God. One of God's quote-unquote henchmen, if you like. Guess who else is an angel or an agent of God? Beowulf. Nope. Mm -hmm. Within scripture, let's say. Read the book of Job. And if you don't know the book of Job, you really got to read that. Because so much medieval renaissance literature plays upon themes of Job. How does Job begin? You got the character Job. Has a wonderful life. I mean, he's Frank Capra's wonderful life. You know, Jim Stewart and all that. Suffering. Why does the suffering happen? Because, meanwhile, back in heaven, 
So Job's down here, has a great life. Meanwhile, back in heaven, the sons of God appeared before God. And included in the sons of God is the devil. And God's like, what's up? What's up, dev? <laughs> and he, what you doing? He says, I'm wandering around the world. I see Job. He's and no, he doesn't bring up Job. God does. God does. Have you taken notice of my servant Job? He goes, yeah, I've noticed. You filthy rat bastard. <laughs> and what does Job say? Exactly. He wouldn't worship you, you know, if he weren't so blessed. God says, okay, I'll take that bet. Take away everything he has. Don't touch him, don't touch his family. <laughs> Everything's wiped out. Satan goes before God again. God says, so, I see you uh, took away everything Job has. I'm like, man, he's still faithful. Yeah, but let me, God says, okay. You can touch him and his family, just don't kill him. What does he do? Wipes out his family, all of his kids. And he's got like 18, 12 sons and seven daughters or something like that. Wipes them all out. Job's wife says to Job, as he's sitting in the pile of ashes, cutting the boils, like, you know, I don't know, 2,500 B.C. AIDS on his arms, she says, curse God and die. Job, yet though I die, yet though he slay me, I know my Redeemer liveth. Okay? And God's like, oh, God, Job. <laughs> how does the rest of it then happen? Job's friends come in, well, this obviously happens to you because you've sinned. You've offended God. You pissed the big guy off, and now he's, he's like, I haven't done anything. Here's where it's really important, and, and we're kind of tied in here, and a lot of you include. Job says, me and God, we need to have a talk. I'm blameless in this. And all of a sudden, a tornado comes, and out of the tornado a voice. All right, here I am. <laughs> Lay it all in front of me. Come on, what's your problem? And Job's uh, kind of like uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, Theseus, when he comes to some guy who can't, you know, give him the welcome. And God just starts asking him questions. What kind of questions? Come on, Job, what's two plus two? No. They're rhetorical questions. Where were you when I made the earth? Damn, that's a zero. Where were you when I came up with the idea of the snowflake? There's another zero. Giraffe? God's whole point is, who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> you are nothing. I create. And Job's like, okay. So here we have, it's a well-known truth, mighty God. And then Grindel bore God's anger. Like Pharaoh. Because what does Pharaoh do? Pharaoh bears God's anger. But then after the Jews come out of Israel, excuse me, out of Egypt, they go into Israel. What do they repeatedly do? Because, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it's the next book. Joshua, book after that, Judges. Well, why do they have to have judges? Because they repeatedly disobey God. They repeatedly disobey. What does God do? He sends the Philistines, he sends Goliath, he sends all kinds of problems to them. To smack them upside the head, that's my computer which is on its last leg, to smack them upside the head for what purpose? To bring them back. Is Grindel there to bring them back? Because what were we told the Danes did, way too far off, the Danes did after Grindel first came, they sacrificed at heathen temples. So it might have been that Grindel's first attack wasn't bringing God's anger. But every night after, he's kind of like, hello. <laughs> it's not that Grindel's saying, repent. I come bearing God's anger. Grindel's not doing that. Grindel's merely what? Apparently every night. Really, really hungry. And Danger like T-bone steaks, apparently. So. They're fat and happy and they taste like beer. Yeah. Marinated. 
Okay. So, Grendel comes in, and he eats this guy. I mean, he just reaches out. What does Beowulf do? He watches. Okay, if you've never caught that before, he simply watches. Phrase for him? Sucks to be him. His name, by the way, comes up later. It's Honshu. Modern English. Hand. Shoe. Bingo. That's all how you say it in German. It's exactly German. what it means. He is a glove, if you want. I mean, if you want to translate his name. And we're going to be told by Beowulf, what did Grendel do with Honshu, even though I just said he ate him? Beowulf is going to say, you know, what Grendel wanted to do is he wanted to take Honshu and stuff him into a glove made of, and this is really cool, dragon skin. Glove? Glove. So he wanted to take Hanshu and stuff him in a Hanshu. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he kills Hanshu, eats him, and then he reaches down for the very next one, like appetizer. <laughs> and then appetizer, 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 entree, 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 dessert, 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 whatever. And Beowulf reaches up. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Beowulf. You just ate my guy. Dragon Slayer. That was my friend. And we're told, 750, as soon as that shepherd of sins discovered that he had never met on earth, Middle Earth in any region of the world, another man with a greater hand grip in his heart, he was afraid for his life. What did Grindel think the moment he felt Beowulf's hand? Oh, shit. Oh, yeah. Wrong one. Beowulf has the strength of 30 men in his hand. Grendel's never met anything like this before. And we're told, 758, the good kinsman of Helak remembered in his evening speech and stood upright and seized him fast. Like, it's just, you know, a matter of course. Grabs his hand and goes, oh yeah, I said I would kill him. You know, I almost forgot. Stands up. And what do they do? What kind of fight do they have? Are they sitting there punching each other? Beowulf hitting him with the sword? No, because he's not using the sword. This is like one of those wrestling matches where you have to hold the other guy's hand up. What are you trying to do? Throw him out of the circle? Well, here, there's no circle to be thrown out of because they're inside the hall. They're throwing each other up against the wall but never letting go of their hands. Okay? Beowulf's men obviously wake up, and what do they decide? Oh, fuck. Well, no, not really. They're going to get involved. So they whip out their swords. They go to hit Grendel, and what happens? Bing! Why? Because he has a, an ability that deflects uh, what's called. He has a spell woven about him that protects him from any sword. Well, it's just kind of fortuitous. Mm -hmm. Chose the word intentionally that Beowulf decided not to use a sword. So... Grendel wants to get away from there. How does he? Notice Grendel does this. Beowulf doesn't do it to him. Yeah. Several years ago, eight years ago, January of 2010, stepped outside my garage, was putting something in the garbage can. There was snow. Didn't realize that underneath the snow, there was ice. I stepped on the ice and, went whoosh, and broke my fall like this, with my arm on the ground. And when I fell, I totally ripped my entire rotator cuff so that my arm just went <coughs> pain. Closest I can imagine it, you know, anybody else could experience would be a woman going through childbirth. My wife said four kids, she described the pain. All of them without epidurals. You know, and then we go to the emergency room and they're like, you know, I need you to raise your arm up like this. Or, you know, I'm like, that damn fool, I can't raise my arm, period. There's nothing, there, you got to have leverage. And it's nearly passed out. That's what, almost similar to what Grendel goes with. He goes the further step. Because Beowulf's holding on, he pulls away until it snap, crackle, and pop. All right? 
Grindel leaves. While he leaves, he's doing what? Screaming out. Black Knight, Monty Python, and the Holy Grail. Psh, 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 psh. Blood, gore, just dripping. Okay? Yes, it was just a flesh wound. And we're told, 823, the wishes of the Danes were entirely fulfilled in that bloody onslaught. He who had come from afar and cleansed Dwight's and stout heart of the hall of Hrothgar, um, warded off attack, he rejoiced in his night work, etc. And what does Beowulf do? He takes Grindel's arm and he hangs it up like mistletoe from the ceiling. With its nail-like claws. Nail, like, like nails that you use for wood. But they're the fingernails of Grenville. So in the morning, people come. They find out what happened. And they start to follow the trail of blood and gore. Line 847. The water was welling with blood there. The terrible swirling waves all mingled together with hot gore. Heaved with the blood of battle. Concealed that doom when wind deprived of joys he laid on his life in his lair in the fen. His heathen soul in hell took him. Now this is the poet saying this. All right. Then the old retainers returned from there. And young ones too. And what do they do? They celebrate Beowulf's glory, 856 and following. It was often said that north or south, between the two seas, across the wide world, no one better to be king than Beowulf. 863. But, but they didn't find any fault with their own gracious king, Hrothgar, but said he was a good king. That's the instance in the poem where you get Ak, fat, was, gold, king. We have two instances in the poem where you get fat, was gold tinning, two of those, and one with that. Okay? So what does it mean? Yeah, but Hrothgar was a good king. What would we maybe throw off at the end? Two. <laughs> That's not, you know, superlative praise. So we're told... As they're making their way, way back, some shope, line 867, the king's thane, full of grand stories, mindful of songs, who remembered much, a great many of the old tales, found other words truly bound together. That is, in his repertoire of songs up here, in the language, he selected one word here, one word here, one word here, one word here, bound them together. That's the old English alliterative tradition. He made things alliterate, right, have the right meter, and what did he do with that? He recited the skill, the adventure of Beowulf, told an apt tale, and then he equates Beowulf with Sigamund. Okay? One of the greatest heroes in Germanic myth. Because Sigamund did what? Kill a dragon? He killed a dragon. Poet has just linked Beowulf with, with a dragon killer. Kind of a little bit of foreshadowing, possibly. And how did Sigamund kill the dragon? Okay. You got a long footnote, make sure you read it. Well, in the traditional Valsinger saga, Sigamund digs a trench. He gets in the trench, and Fafnir the dragon slithers over and Sigmund uh, with his sword up through Fafnir. He kills him. He does that in the Valsinger saga. Uh, one, because Fafnir is a bad dragon. Fafnir used to be a person. A dwarf, wasn't it? Dwarf. Okay? Who became a dragon. We can talk about that if you want later. But, according to another dwarf, if you drink dragon's blood, you'll learn the speech of animals and such. Okay? So, we're told here that, line 890 and, fo and following, Sigamund killed the dragon 
Yet so it befell him that his sword pierced the wondrous serpent, stood fixed in the wall. Okay? Shagman kills the dragon, and the sword is sticking out of the wall now. Keep this in mind. Dragon dies. He's the most famous of exiles. Wait, who's the most famous of exiles? Line 898. He was the most famous of exiles, far and wide, among all people, protector of warriors, for his noble deeds. He had prospered for them since the struggles of Haramod had ceased, his might and valor. That is, Beowulf is that one being talked about, I think, if I remember right. Might be um, Sigmund. Um, and then you have Haramod mentioned. Haramod is the quintessential bad king. He is held up as a model of badness. Don't do what Haramod does. Among the Jews, he was betrayed into his enemy's hands, quickly dispatched. Why? The surging of cares had crippled him too long. He became a deadly burden to his own. It's his own people that betrayed him into his enemy's hands. Why did they do that? For many a wise man had mourned in earlier times over his headstrong ways, who had looked to him for relief from affliction. The people looked to the king for relief, and the king did what? He just added to their sorrow and trouble and such. The kinsman of Helak became to all the race of mankind a more pleasant that is, he wasn't like Haramoth. He did help his people. And then you get sin possessed him. Not Beowulf, Haramoth. So, they come back. Fit 14. We get Hrothgar. He spoke. But he doesn't speak immediately because he goes to the hall. And he says, for this sight let us swiftly offer thanks to the Almighty. Thank you, God. Why? Much have I endured of dire grief from Grendel, but God may always work, shepherd of glory, wonder upon wonder. Hmm. It was not long ago that I did not expect ever in my life to experience relief from any of my woes. In other words, he was like what person? Not one we just recently been talking about, but one we talked about on Tuesday. He was like that guy in lines 175 to 188 who will suffer woe because he doesn't ever expect comfort, any change. And therefore he suffers the fire's embrace. In fact, he says, I did not expect ever in my life to experience relief from any of my foes when stained with blood this best of houses stood dripping, gory, a widespread woe to all wise men who did not expect that is, even the wise men did not expect that they might ever defend the people's fortress from its foes, devil, devils and demons, or devils and demons. He is saying, we were all essentially in the fire's embrace. Why? Prior to Beowulf coming, we didn't expect anything to change. And yet right after Beowulf came, what did Hrothgar say? God could have stopped this if he wanted to, apparently stopped to think, why would God not want to stop it? Even here, God may always work wonder upon wonder. Yeah, well, why didn't he before? What else is he possibly suggesting? God sent Beowulf. As the poet suggested, God sent shield shedding. Right? Now a retainer has done the very deed through the might of God. Beowulf has become, in Hrothgar's language, an agent of God. That's why Beowulf has that strength. I mean, Hrothgar even said, I've heard tales that God has given him the strength of 30 men. Okay? So, which we could not contrive to do with all our cleverness, 941 and 2. Well, what was all their cleverness? Avoid the problem. Okay, avoid the problem. Get drunk and see what that does. 
and offering Sacrifice. sacrifices at pagan temples. Lo, that woman could say, whoever has born such a son into the race of men, if she still lives, that the God of old was good to her in childbearing. This is kind of like, I'm not saying it is, but it's kind of like Mary's Magnificat. When Elizabeth comes to her and Elizabeth says, how is it that I should meet the mother of my Lord? And Mary just launches into this, my soul shall magnify the Lord, blah, blah, blah. What has he said? God has blessed that woman for bringing this Savior, this Deliverer. All right? Blessed art thou among women, Gabriel says to Mary. That woman can say, whoever that God has blessed her. So, Beowulf, I'm going to cherish you like a son. Like a son implies what? Adoption. Henceforth, hold well your new kinship. You won't lack. Yeah, I'll give you a credit card. <laughs> you know, it's no problems. So, he says, you've done by yourself such deeds that your fame will endure always and forever. May the Almighty God reward you with good as he already has done. Beowulf, freely and gladly have we fought this fight. Why does it begin freely? What did Hrothgar say was the real reason Beowulf has come? You owe me. Me. you owe me. This is Beowulf, I think. Could be wrong. I don't think so. This is Beowulf's way of saying I did this of my own free will. And notice, not I, we. Is this the royal we? No. We. Me and my band of brothers. Why? They came with me. They helped me. Not really. <laughs> they were like, yay, Beowulf. Sure <laughs> kill Grindel. <laughs> Please, kill Grindel. Don't let him eat any more of us. You know? Avenge Hanshu. Yeah, avenge Hanshu. So he says, I wanted Grindel to be here, but, you know, I couldn't stop that. Why? 967, the creator did not wish it. I wanted to stop him, but God had other plans. Then, you know, I'm not going to go against God. Okay? So, he says, Grindel went off to die. Line 975. Rotten with sin, but pain has seized him, grabbed him tightly in its fierce grasp, that's baleful bonds. And there he shall abide, there in his lair down under the lake, guilty of his crimes, the greater judgment, how the shining maker wishes to sentence him. What has Beowulf not done in that statement? Killed him, but he's going to die, he says. And he's leading, leaving his judgment to whom? Notice, Beowulf doesn't say what the poet said. Grindel's going to rot in hell. He says, I'll leave it to God. It's God's job. It's not my, my job. My job is just to kill him. <laughs> to send him to God. You know, I, I did my bit. Okay? Now, about you, to me, that's very odd. That Beowulf and go, yeah, and he deserves to burn for all eternity. Why, why doesn't he cast judgment at all? Judge not lest he be judged. Okay, that's one reason. Which probably not many of the auditors of the poem, especially hearing in 1000 AD, okay, um, or let me rephrase that. Especially if the poem's early and they're hearing it in 700 AD, would be aware of. Kind of the noble and then kind of Christian in name warriors. Okay? Maybe more would by 1000 AD. They've had time to listen to homilies and things like that. Why else? Who has Beowulf ascribed the victory to? Repeatedly. 
Not God. Nope. God. No. God. He says, God did this, you know. God stopped me from stopping Grindel, etc. Then the son of Edgelaf was more silent in boasting words. That pretty much shut up Uther. Okay? So, they clean up Hera, they decorate it again, they're going to have a party. And Hrothgar comes to the hall. It's a big feast. And we're told, line 1014, Fairly those kinsmen took many a full mead cup, stout-hearted in the high hall. Who were the kinsmen? Hrothgar and Hrothgar. So, let's draw the hall again. So now we have Hrothgar sitting here. We have Ulfirth at his feet. We have now Hrothulf mentioned. We have Hrothric, Hrothmund, the big bee sitting in between them. And Welthael is kind of flitting around. Okay. So who's Rolf? Hrothgar's nephew. Okay. Herod within was filled with friends. No false treacheries did the people of the Shieldings plot. Period. At that time. At that time means they did plot treacheries later. You got a gloss down at the bottom. Implicit in the statement is the idea that at some time later, the people of Shieldings did plot false treacheries. From other sources, Norse materials, it's possible to infer that after the death of Hrothgar, his nephew Hrothulf ruled, rather than Hrethric, Hrothgar's son. Many scholars assume that the story of some sort of treasonous, uh, treacherous usurpation was known to the audience. This gives a special urgency to much of what happens in these scenes of feasting, especially in the speeches of Welthair. What all that really means is, according to other materials, Hrothulf didn't only become king after Hrothgar's death. He usurped the throne. Okay? In Welthair, now, within the world of is already worried about that. She already doesn't trust her nephew. See, these two are not yet old enough slash strong enough to rule. If Rethrick dies, Hoffman isn't old enough and strong enough to rule. Rethrick isn't old enough and strong enough to rule. They're probably something like 11 and 9 or 12 and 9. Right? The nephew of a but he's a full-grown warrior. Hrothulf, yeah. Pretty, pretty serious warrior in, in the other Norse materials. So, Hrothgar promises Beowulf buku treasure. I mean, just all kinds of stuff. And then even Welthael gives him some treasure. So we get fit 16. What else does Hrothgar do? He gives treasure to Beowulf to take back to the land of the Geats for the people that are related to Anshu. He pays, in other words, the wear guild, literally the man gold. See, in Germanic society, and this is all codified. It's actually written down in Anglo-Saxon laws. You know, you kill somebody, you can, you can resolve that situation by paying that person's family a certain amount. And the amount was actually codified in the laws, depending upon the dead person's level in society. The churl, the guy who worked the fields for you, had the lowest amount, and a duke or earl, etc., pretty high amount. Okay? So, this is what Hrothgar does. He pays the price for Hanshu. Why? Hanshu died defending Hrothgar. Pretty fair dealing here. The maker ruled, line 1057. Sorry. 
And then order that, uh, 1054, that gold be paid for the man whom Grendel wickedly slain. He would have done more if wise God and one man's courage had not prevented that fate. The he there, Grendel would have done more. That is, it wouldn't be only Hanshu, Hrothgar would be forking out for. The maker ruled all of the race of mankind as he still does. Obviously, no make passage. But the poet doesn't stop there. As he still does implies when. Okay? you got to imagine this is not being read. This is being performed for an audience. And an audience hears that. As he still does means what? Right now. Well, put yourself within the world of the audience of the poem, depending upon when that is. A thousand AD, you're in England, you don't have too much to worry about. Yeah, though the Vikings are starting to get rambunctious again. Okay? But in 800 AD, you got 911 essentially every day. Vikings are coming every day. Yet God rules the race of mankind. As he still does. What might that, what purpose might that serve for an audience? He's in control. Yeah, it looks really bad. He's in control. It's kind of a, it's a bit of a consolation. It's like, oh, don't worry. You might even die. He's still in control. Therefore, understanding is always best. Spiritual foresight. Well, here's the understanding slash spiritual foresight the poet wants to get across. He must face much, both love and hate, who long here endures this world in these days of strife. These days of strife does not imply necessarily that we are at open war. That's the, just a description for life, right? That's everybody's life. Days of strife. Doesn't matter whether you're five years old or 50 years old. Things don't always go as you wish. That means you are in strife. <coughs> okay? So, the poet, the show, then comes out and sings a song. And the song is... The story of Hildeburg, and it's called <clears throat> the Finsburg episode. Okay, why? Because at a, at a guy named Finn, his burg, his castle, his fortress. Interestingly, this is one thing in the Beowulf manuscript. We have another copy. We have a thing called the Finsburg Fragment. We don't have the actual fragment anymore. It was lost in the 18th century, but we have an 18th century handwritten copy of it. Okay? But again, it's only a fragment. We think, I don't remember how long the fragment is, it's a couple hundred lines, but we think the fragment was originally part of a much longer thing, at least 800 or 1,000 lines. Okay? And it's not just a retelling of what we see here. It's a little bit different, but it's got pretty strong similarities. What's the whole purpose of the Finsburg episode? What do we see happen? This woman, Hildeburg, marries this guy named Finn. Hildeburg is a Dane. Finn is a Frisian, a Frank. Okay? She marries him. She goes off to live with him. She brings some of her retainers. Her brother, Hengist, um, no, not Hengist. Her brother, Knaff. Uh, we don't have time for this. Okay, we'll pick this up on Tuesday. <sighs> Too many genealogies. I need to put that stuff on Facebook. Uh, not on Facebook, on the class. Uh,